Hey everyone. I am the Reader Engagement Manager, Erin McKinley. I am here helping out SCNG today with their Zoom webinar. Um, and before I turn it over to Sandra and Sam, I just have a few housekeeping notes that I wanted to go over. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions during our presentation, go ahead and use that Q&A button uh, that you'll find on your Zoom toolbar. Uh, we're gonna try to get to all the questions that we can, and we will be taking them live during each of our little uh, segments. So if we don't get to all the questions, we apologize, but we will try to answer the questions afterwards and post a, an online article with those questions and answers. Um, if you have anything else that you'd wanna just chat with us uh, or leave a comment, go ahead and use that chat feature uh, that you see as well. We'd love to hear from you. And then just a quick note that everyone here for our attendees are going to be muted. We wanna make sure that our guests and our panelists have the opportunity to kind of have a free flowing conversation. Um, we are gonna get started, like I said, in about one minute, we're gonna go ahead and let some more of our subscribers join in. So if you guys could hang tight, that would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, folks, I think we're just about ready to go. Um, again, for everyone who just joined, uh, my name's Erin McKinley. I am helping out the SCNG team today with our uh, Zoom meetup. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask uh, during the conversation, please use that Q&A function. That's how we're gonna take in all of our questions. Um, if you have any other comments, um, just like to say hello, go ahead and, and use that chat feature. We'd uh, love to hear from you. And now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce to you one of SCNG's editors, Samantha Dunn. She's an award-winning journalist and author of several books and currently is, serves as the executive editor here at SCNG. So, hey Sam, how's it going? Hey Erin, it's great. Thanks so much for helping out, the technical genie that you are. <laughs> uh, and I wanna thank you guys too, all of you valued subscribers and everybody else who's joined us for this you know, salon style conversation with writers and performers uh, about books and ideas. And it's sure to offer opinions and perspectives that are, are going to be interesting. Um, I just want to say we value your support as subscribers and readers, and we're proud to bring you events like this. Anyway, um, as Aaron said, at uh, SCNG, I'm an editor at, for the special publications, like the one that inspired this show, which was Lit Up, Your Guide to Books, Writers, and the Literary Life of uh, SoCal. That was published May 31st. Um, and it was a topic near and dear to my heart because of course I'm also an author and longtime citizen of the literary scene in Southern California, which is where I met and became friends some uh, I don't know, 25 years ago uh, with the host of this event who I'd like to introduce you to now. She is the well-known NPR commentator, performer, contributor at The Atlantic. What does this woman do? not do. And she's also the author of several books, including her newest one, which is Mad Woman and the Roomba. Please meet my pal, Sandra Singlo. Sandra. Hello, Sam. How is it that your, your quarantine hair looks so much better than mine? I tried to stick it down. I don't know what yeah. happened. Um, it's my superpower, honey. What can I say? <laughs> well, it's so great to be doing this because we've been having this discussion for 25 years since we were five years old. <laughs> Uh, and, and I think it's great that, that we're asking the question, Southern California literature, yes. Samantha, is that a contradiction in terms? We're not New York of the black sweaters and the skyscrapers, and the, we're, we're out here in the West, we're mm -hmm. sunny and there are palm trees. And, you know, do we think, do we not think? Can you explain? You know, that is so funny, Sandra, because the New York Times actually asks this question every year cyclically, you know, is there, is there a literary scene in Southern California? And, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised to find one. In fact, um, Southern California, as you know, has long attracted writers, sometimes against their better judgment to Hollywood, like <laughs> Scott Fitzgerald and, and, you know, William Faulkner. But, you know, the truth is that there is no one Southern California literary scene. There are many Southern California literary scenes. There's the Beverly Hills scene. There's the 
world stage at Lemert Park. There's the desert of Deanne Stillman's imagination. There's OC with Dean Koontz and Teach Everson Parker. There's the Latinx scene with Luis Rodriguez and Miriam Gerba and the groovy poets of Beyond Baroque in Venice. I mean, you know, girl, we can talk about this all day. Yeah, and I think that even, I think the diversity that you mention, and that it's it's not just a buzzword. I mean, back in the day, Buzz Magazine was a magazine many years ago in Southern California. I remember doing a piece on Baywatch, that Baywatch was the number one export of Southern California to the globe, okay. to 40 countries. And so that the world had an image of Southern California of being kind of this beach with Pamela Anderson, all those people loping in their swimsuits, all these blondes that basically all had come from the Midwest, from Ohio and Iowa. <laughs> so like, they actually weren't from here. And as I would like to say, so I am a Southern California native. This, sorry about the bad hair, is what a Southern California native looks like. I grew up Chinese German in Malibu. We were brown children confused under swaying palm trees, dressed as it happened because my mother was German in Sound of Music outfits because she was really obsessed with the Von Trapp family. So to a certain extent, and I think it's what we trace in the next exciting eight weeks, and we look through some of these um, themes that come up. One of my favorite themes that I looked at of like, my piece was Aliens in America was my book about that, of LA, is, or, or LA and then Southern California also, sometimes I'm about feeling like an outsider looking in because we all come from a lot of different places. There's no one, uh, story here and the way people of, of a diverse way make those stories happens and I mean and it is so diverse isn't it I mean what is how many different languages over 225 languages are spoken you know the Korea town has a bigger Korean population than anywhere else except for Korea uh, Glendale more Armenians you know outside of Armenia so it is so multicultural it is so global and um, that's why we're here but I want to ask one other question yeah that is Okay, so Lit Up was started in incredible time in, in a pandemic. You guys were yes. talking about this in February. Can you talk yeah. about that? I, I would like to take credit for this idea, but it was actually my boss's idea. You know, I, I try to take good credit for all ideas when I can, but, but you know, as you know, the pandemic shuttered not only book tours for authors, <laughs> as you personally know, um, you know, who make their rounds at local bookstores, but it also, I, you know, shuttered all of the festivals that us bookworms love during the year, Pasadena Lit Fest, Literary Orange in Orange County, and of course, uh, the Festival of Books. So we decided that this was a real opportunity to, um, to create a publication that would be a way that writers and readers could connect and continue the conversation about books through the summer when nobody had any... Uh, any ability to go out and actually go to, you know, go to readings or anything. Right, and, and reading is one of the COVID safe things that you can safely do. And of yeah. course things, and, and because, and of course books don't always catch up immediately with the news of the day. So that's kind of also the dance that's being played. And of course, in the last couple of weeks, we've gotten into this new national conversation about racial inequity. And, um, and so that, that will be developing as we go. So although we're talking about books, we're gonna reflect that conversation also as much as we can through the eyes of writers. Right, I mean, we really looked at this and thank you for coming on board with the idea. We really looked at this, uh, this uh, virtual series as a way to extend the conversation, to, to keep the, the conversation going about ideas and, and literature, about literature and just about the culture at large. So, um, so thanks. And so that, my dear, brings us to our first author. So I'm going to say, Let's say goodbye to Samantha Dunn, who will come back at the end of the hour for exciting housekeeping and letting us know what's coming for next week. Hasta luego. Bye, Hi, Samantha. Sam. Let me bring on and welcome Jervie Tarvalon, our first guest. Now, Jervie, what's going to happen is you're our very first guest. So before each guest, I'm going to do what I call the 30-second download on the author. You may know Jervie or you may be new to Jervie. So, and, and know that all of our authors, it's a little slightly different book show, are, have so many awards, it would take three hours to read the awards that each person has. So I'm just going to read you my sort of take on maybe a teaser to get you intrigued to listen to read uh, Jervy stuff. So Jervy, you can see how well I do. Okay, okay, so here I go. My 30 second download. Okay, 
born in New Orleans, raised in what used to be known as South Central, now known as South Los Angeles, Jeremy Tarbellon's novels include All the Trouble You Need, Understand This, Dead Above Ground, and also Monsters Chef, which, just to give you a flavor, is about the chef of a somewhat shady music superstar appropriately named Monster. Very intriguing. Uh, you'll just have to read it. You'll just have to read it. His work is gritty, dark, hilarious, thought-provoking, and it just may make you hungry. Mm. There, there are recipes in Monster Chef. And in 2012, speaking of uh, literary festivals, with the late great food critic, the Pulitzer Prize winner Jonathan Gold, and Pasadena Star News columnist Larry Wilson, Jervy started Pasadena Lit Fest on the and this side of town. Um, welcome, Jervy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I just wanted to make, uh, just make, mention one thing. The New York Times did, uh, what, uh, the Japanese American book reviewer, one of their principal book reviewers. She, yeah, she did the, uh, she discovered this book of uh, a memoir by this white girl who was raised by uh, a family of crips. And, uh, and <laughs> they seemingly found her wandering around the San Fernando and they took her in and raised her and you know, that kind of thing. And so she became a, a gang member and, um, and the, the woman that brought her in was Big Mama. And as soon as I read that it was Big Mama, I knew it was totally fake. And so it became a big uh, scandalous thing that the New York Times ended up publishing a fake memoir about this woman, this white woman who just appropriated. Her sister said, she said, you know, we were raised, we went to private schools. She just made all this up <laughs> after yeah. the fact. Oh my God, yeah, the ways of like kind of making fiction, making sort of, fiction or entertaining fiction out of real stuff. And so that's why it's great to have a unique, like voices that actually come from where they're writing about. So, yeah. and, and so I would ask you just, uh, first of all, I mean, how does it feel just in this particular moment, you as a creative writer, there's so much stuff in the news. Do you feel just creatively, uh, you want to react immediately or you go, I need to digest for a while, which will lead up to another question I'm going to ask you. Well, I'm writing uh, a piece for the Times, the COVID uh, diary. So yeah. it's, it's interesting to try to fit all the different parts in. But one of the interesting things is going to these events, the Black Lives Matter. Right. And, um, and, you know, my wife's Chinese. We have a biracial daughter. You know, um, you know my other daughter is African-American, my other two daughters. And now when I go to these BLM things, I see all this diversity. I see as many... Latinos as black people, as many Asians as white people. And so it's like, it's weird to see this change where LA is becoming this kind of specific kind of culture where I didn't, it's different than when I was raised and it's a beautiful thing to be in the middle of it. Yeah, and I think you've really traced the history of, uh, you know, kind of like, the, let's see, these, these street protests, if you will, for a long time, because I think of the anthology that you edited in 2002, The Geography of Rage, were you already, which is there, were, were you looked at essays um, that already were talking about the LA uprisings of 1992, the Rodney King events from already a distance of 10 years past looking. So first of all, can I ask you about the title, The Geography of Rage? Why that title? It, it did seem like, <laughs> like a geography of rage. When I was experiencing, I was teaching high school at the time. And- yeah, Is that at Locke? In Locke? Yeah, I was teaching at Locke. And you know, I, I was raised in the Jefferson Park part of Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of people from New Orleans, but I tend to be kind of racially ambiguous. If I'm a white, I'm a Hawaiian. If I'm in China, I'm a Filipino, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It doesn't matter. So, um, so I remember I was wearing my Malcolm X hat and just trying to be as black as possible when I was going to teach at Locke in the both sides of the 110 freeway were burning. Actually, I was also, I was actually in, UC Irvine's MFA program and Thomas Keneally was my professor down there. So it was just a very, very crazy time. And I remember Erin Arbery was dealing with covering the thing and uh, her family also is from New Orleans. And also I'm supposed to ask you, Sandra, would you write another essay for us for the Geography of Rage 2020? Erin wanted me to ask you. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, of course, of course. And kind of like, but I would have to, you know, to be honest, I, I feel like I would have to write it very carefully because of how, how quickly language changes nowadays um, of like you use a one word one day and then the next day it's obsolete. So something that we're seeing, and I think it's interesting to talk about as writers is as the way language changes, even though it kind of like South Central is now a lot, lot, South Los Angeles and it's kind of like, it, and I think that's something 
as writers that we kind of pay attention to a lot. Of, and I wonder with the perspective of history, if you, I mean, if, you know, do you think there'll be a similar cycle 10 years from now looking back at this time? Or is there something that surprised you that came up in the geography of rage at, at a tenure distance that you didn't really think of at the time? Well, the, they, you know, I'm involved in these programs at USC, the Neighborhood Academic Initiative. And when I went to Fauche in the 70s, and it was one of the most worst experiences of my life, it was very, very dangerous. Uh, now, uh, you know, it's one of the top uh, schools, feeder schools for USC, the top feeder school for USC. And people all around the world are coming there because of what Kim Barrios did in the Neighborhood Academic Initiative. But uh, that school now is majority Latino, it's about 80% Latino. So it's weird when I'm teaching those students, you know, there's some black kids still, when they talk, they don't know they're actually speaking a variant, well, they're speaking what I would consider to be Los Angeles black English uh, in that particular <laughs> region. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, uh, my high school girlfriend, uh, she lived in Ladera Park. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, right next to Ladera Park. And so, you know, there are a lot of kids who are affluent from Baldwin Hills. And Baldwin Hills happens to be the most affluent African-American community in the world, the African diaspora uh, community, what I've read. And uh, so a lot of that is actually vanishing because people are moving into the community, uh, gentrifying it because it's close enough to, you know, the, so whatever it's called, beach, the uh, tech world. So uh, I'm not sure if, ex if the African-American presence is going to be there in LA, except for people who are affluent enough to be able to move and live this kind of bohemian lifestyle that, you know, I wouldn't mind living. I, I could move back to Vernon <laughs> the Merck Park, but, you know, I do well, like Altadena. And I think going back to when you're teaching English at Locke High School in Watts, uh, is there, you know, you're teaching English, and it's interesting that, that you know, Fauche is a feeder school to USC where T.C. Boyle has taught for many years as our guest later. Um, is there any particular work or works of literature that you would teach uh, to your Locke High School students that, particularly resonated or where you go that one's gonna be that one's gonna work obviously many are not but for um, any high school student but you know they uh what what i discover um is that i try to find pieces that are really uh engaging as quickly as possible so vignettes work really well so one day i taught uh up in michigan uh this hemingway short story to one of my my students and this gangbanger, you know, I got along really well because I always bought the oldies and they liked the fact that I would play the oldies and they thought I was a big ass bouncer. So one, so one of them says, hey, Mr. Turbulent, ain't no real story. And I said, what do you mean it's no real story? Because it ain't real because, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I was like, oh, geez, I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> I'm doing the right thing. Um, Hemingway. Uh, Hemingway, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's something, you know, uh, very taught and that kind of thing. Um, you know, and, and some, you know, I would teach Shakespeare and Shantz because, you know, like, uh, it's like, look, you guys, they don't tell you that, you know, this character, if this is emblematic or biographical of the sonnets, if you read the trajectory, trajectory of it, essentially he goes from being in love with, uh, you understand he's actually in love with a woman and a man, and the woman steals a man away from him, and he's really pissed. And then they get really engaged and <laughs> read the poetry in a, a totally... Uh, different, uh, totally different way, so. But yeah, that's what I would try. I, I, one time I came across the article about the fact in that community, a lot of kids were getting VD, uh, young girls were getting VD, and they were worried about the AIDS epidemic at that time, because it turned out that these young girls and these older guys were both getting uh, syphilis. And I realized that these girls were coming from families where the mothers, the parents probably were drug addicted. And they didn't have anybody watching out for them and older men that had social security were preying on them. Because how else would you have this weird vector of right. old dudes and young girls right. getting, you know, syphilis at the same time. Right. Um, uh, the other, uh, the Desiree's Baby by, um, oh God, I can't think of her name right now, but um, you know, that's only four pages. But yeah. it sums up racism, self-loathing, all of that so quickly. So I always teach, I always would teach that too. 
So what we may do is, is take some of these and give a small mailing list and put it in the chat for later because I think it's really mesmerizing. So anyway, thank you so much for joining. Oh, we, would talk, we would love to talk more, and, but, but we'll see. Maybe later <laughs> in the series we will. But Jervy Tarvalon, thanks so much for being with us. The, the uh, essay anthology is The Geography of Rage, and your most recent novel is Monsters Chat. So thanks, thank Jervy, for being All with right. us. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now with, with great pleasure, I pivot to a special guest today before we go to TC Boyle. And that is Richard Blanco. So excited that you are here. So um, I, and so Richard, what we do is now you're in Maine and I'll explain why we're, we consider you one of ours in Southern California where it's three hours later. So what you're, I'm gonna do the 30 second download on Richard Blanco. So you'll listen and see how, how close I came. Okay. Okay. So Richard Blanco was chosen by Barack Obama, remember him, in 2012 to be the nation's fifth presidential inaugural poet, an honor he shares with Robert Frost and Maya Angelou. Robert, Richard is the youngest as well as first Latino and gay poet to serve in this role. It's four books of poetry, How to Love a Country. Boy, that title becomes ever more resonant, doesn't it? City of 100 Fires, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, and Looking for the Gulf Motel. I do want to end with this factoid. As Richard, we're saying so many awards, it would take hours, so we don't do them. We just do the bio. So listen to this. In 1968, Richard's family, including his mother, who was seven months pregnant with Richard, uh, arrived as exiles from Cuba to Madrid, Spain, 45 days later, off they immigrate to New York City. So I can be said of Richard Blanco, made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, imported to the USA. That's Welcome, right. Gary. <laughs> <I> <laughs> said... Thank you, Richard, sorry. Yes, oh my gosh, it's so great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Great to be back, so to speak. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and so, you know, as I think I mentioned to you, this is a family show. So there are kids watching, future poets, so I, as though I'm asking the question for them, but really we fan adults want to know, can you just, what is it like to be chosen as the Obama inaugural presidential poet? How does, how does that work? Um, still a mystery to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I got the call while I was driving home, actually from a little bit of a road trip, uh, and I thought it was a joke um, till the uh, the person said, no, like Maya Angelou and Robert Frost. And I'm like, oh, I still thought it was a joke. Uh, so I, I, I Googled uh, the person's name and sure enough, it was a scheduler of surrogates for the presidential inaugural committee. Um, so it was really, it was really fascinating, but there's no, you know, there's no short list so you don't apply for this. There's no finalists. Um, and although I've had, I've had several engagements uh, with the president since then, I've never sort of point blank asked him <laughs> what happened <laughs> because I prefer to stay in my romantic illusion <laughs> that he was sitting in the Oval Office absorbed with my poems and well, canceling he, all his meetings. <laughs> he is known as the vociferous reader, that he would be happy yeah. to take piles of stuff. So I am sure that he did, re I'm sure that he did uh, read it. And then the yeah. process was, but they didn't pick a particular poem you had already written. No, they asked for an original piece, and they actually asked me to write three pieces, um, and then he chose uh, the one that I read. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's 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 been quite a quite an interesting <laughs> connection. I, I I've often wondered, but I think in part um, I was always attracted to President Obama's story, not just because of politics, but also just him as a per like his biography. Um, if I'm complicated, made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, and imported to the United States. He's his child is even more complicated, right? Um, uh, you know, adding a layer of race in there and whatnot. So I think there is we in conversations we've sort of connected on that level. You know, having been grown up, having having uh, grown up with that question of am I part of this American narrative? Is this really my story? Is this, you know, like I always say, do I love America or does America love me back? You know, so 
how to love a country, right? <laughs> you know, and I love what you said that your, you know, your family leaves Cuba and so they go to America. So America's the country they choose. <clears throat> and so this is it, no matter what it is. Like, it's kind of like, not like you go to Costco or Big Lots and like, yeah. it's what you bought. It might be broad. It might be not be what exactly what you want. And I think that tension in your work and that bittersweetness, but the sweetness is really so fantastic. And I think, yeah. I wonder, and, and if you want to know more about Richard Blanco's story, you can get his memoir for all of us, One Today, an inaugural poet's journey where he does lay it out a bit, a, a bit more. And I think I'm intrigued by, I want to say your poem, America, although yeah. I probably said it with my valley accent and you will say it better. <laughs> but when you wrote a poem called America, can you tell a little bit what you'll read for us and about the genesis of this poem? Sure. Um, so it's, I actually have another poem called America, which is about wanting to eat turkey instead of pork on Thanksgiving. But <laughs> this is called America the Beautiful after the song. Uh, America the Beautiful again. And so the genesis is, like you said, Sandra, so on, on point is that, you know, it is kind of a bittersweet relationship because my parents, you know, made this incredible sacrifice, uh, you know, exile from Cuba. Uh, and so in some ways, they're my lifeline to feeling American as well because of that, that act of uh, that leap of faith, as well as to feeling Cuban. And so I remember as a little kid, sort of just always fraught with this kind of patriotism, but not a patriotism, like, you know, the good kind of patriotism before we even knew what politics were before, you know, as a kid. And also my parents were kind of in left field as to any kind of what America, the American landscape, political landscape looked like at the time. So, um, yeah, so this sort of takes its genesis from that and then leaps us forward to today and where we are today. Yeah, right. although I, I do say the, the poem America, because it is about like eat, trying to eat turkey versus pork, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that w is kind of like part of the resonance of Southern California because we're very diverse, but we're all obsessed with food. So <laughs> I, I think that like, like just in talking about food and the and the way that we negotiate that and, uh, you know, our, and our tribes and ethnicities is very yeah. California. But if you wouldn't mind, and I think this poem is so beautiful. And I think that it, especially in this particular time, you know, it's one of my favorites and I make you read it and make yeah, it yeah. I'll probably have you read it on my answer machine um, and, because yeah. it is, it's so beautiful and so so hopeful and you know just the torch in the darkness so if you wouldn't mind yeah sure sure in a sense it's a it's a again because of my parents so I have I haven't given up or given up hope in America still I think so America the beautiful again oh how I sang oh beautiful like a psalm at church with my mother, her Cuban accent scaling up every vowel, oh, be beautiful, yet in perfect pitch, delicate and tuned to the radiant beams of stained glass light. How she taught me to fix my eyes on the crucifix as we sang our thanks to our savior for this country that saved us. Our voices hymns as passionate as the organ piping towards the very heavens. How I sang for spacious skies, closer to those skies while perched on my father's sunbeat shoulders, towering above our first 4th of July parade. How the timber through our bodies mingled, breathing, singing as one with the brass notes of the marching band playing the only song he ever learned in English. How I dared to sing it at assembly with my teenage voice cracking for amber waves of grain. And those purple mountains, majesties that I'd never seen, but could imagine them in each verse rising from my gut. With every exclamation of praise, I bellied out until my throat hurt. America, and again, America. How I began to read Nietzsche and doubt God, yet still wish for God to shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood. How I still want to sing. Despite all the truth of our wars and our gunshots ringing louder than our school bells, our politicians smiling lies at the mic, the deadlock of our divided voices shouting over each other instead of singing together. How I want to sing again, beautiful or not, just to be in harmony from sea to shining sea with the only country I know enough to know how to sing for. That's poetry, people. Anybody who thinks poetry is not powerful, that's 
I just, I'm getting, ah. Still uh, getting it, Sandra. <laughs> I still get, you know, every time, every time. So I, I just wonder in, in closing for some young person who might be out there, um, is there any advice that you might give a young person who might be watching who is, could diverse of any way, you know, a, a, any color, any gender orientation, any, you know, extroverted, introverted, just what's a, one piece of advice you might give a young person who might want to be a poet? Oh, oh, who might want to be a poet? Um, young person, you said, yeah, right? Or diverse, young, any... Yeah, or it could be an old person. I, yeah, or okay. <laughs> a person as old as me, I, but a not so young person. <laughs> really anything, yeah, who might... Well, as the old adage says, writers write, so that's one thing. <laughs> um, uh, listen, uh, if my life is any example, I didn't start writing till I was 27, which at the time seemed like really old. Um, but really just not putting the pressure of saying, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a poet, but really just exploring authentically your creative curiosities and your intellectual curiosities and taking it like everything in life, one baby step at a time. Uh, you, one doesn't just become an engineer or a doctor, right? You, you, learn, you have to take the, and so it, community groups, go to a poetry reading, go to an open mic, take a workshop here or there. Uh, there's so many online possibilities now with workshops, then maybe take another step and take a full term at a community college. Uh, you know, don't try to sign up for an MFA right away. It's just like everything sort of building your craft slowly um, and really getting to know that voice inside of you, right? It's like, I, I think that's, that's most of what writing is. It's just trying to surface and awaken that voice that we already have but we have no language for and so that takes a little bit of time so be patient with yourself be loving with yourself uh love it <laughs> if you're loving it just keep on doing it but uh i wouldn't you know get too many steps ahead you know there is this sort of romantic fantasy or or romanticized idea of, of artists in general that you know everything falls from the sky and inspiration and we just wake up one day or we've been writing poetry since we were two you know and every every journey of every writer is as unique as their own life journey and um um you know, so be confident in that too. It doesn't matter where you come from. You know, I, I have an engineering back, a degree. Um, I never studied literature. I still sort of beat myself up a little bit for that, but yay, that's my journey. Um, and it doesn't matter um, as long as, you, as, long as on, you're on your journey. So I, that's what I would say, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. That, that is, uh, it's, it's so inspiring. And that's, that's all it takes to become a presidential inaugural poet. <laughs> Uh, just what Richard said, if, which way I'm pointing. So anyway, thank you so much. That's Richard Blanco, Obama inaugural poet for Obama's second inauguration. I hope you'll join us again on the series. Thank you so much for joining us for Maine. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Off to dinner. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And I just also want to mention that I virtually met Richard Blanco at the Red Hand Press Poetry Hour put on by the Broad Stage. And the Red Hand Press is another one of our great independent presses that you can read more about in the Lit Up Supplement and many other Southern California um, uh, like riches that we have here. Okay. And now we come to the main course of today's hour and that is with our featured writer, T.C. T. Corrigan Boyle, who joins us. And so T.C., if you don't know, I'm gonna do the 30 minute, I mean the 30 minute, it should be 30 minutes, the 30 second download on T.C. Boyle, but since it's you, I'm gonna to have to read really, really quickly. Okay, so I'm gonna give that a particular uh, try. Um, so, okay, and I have to find my actual piece of paper. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna speak really quickly like a sports announcer. Okay, because T.C. Boyle is Southern California's most celebrated, most prolific, most published, most decorated. He's, he's it, he's, he's, he's our original gangster, but very youthful as you see. T.C. Boyle- Wait a minute, Sandra. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait just a minute. Okay, great. I don't feel comfortable without my mask on. Okay, okay great. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Excellent. Perfect. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm ready. Perfect. T.C. Boyle's 28 books of fiction spanning 40 years from 1979 to 2019 are Descent of Man, Water Music, Budding Prospects, Greasy Lake, World's End, If the River Was Whiskey, East is East, The Road to Wellville, The Tortilla Curtain, Ribbon Rock, A Friend of the Earth After the Plague, Drop City, San Miguel, The Terranauts, Outside Looking In. All of these have been translated into many languages to name just a few. German, French, Italian, Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian, Hebrew, Korean, Japanese, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, Lithuanian, Latvian, Polish, Hungarian, Bulgarian, Finnish, Farsi, Croatian, Turkish, Albanian, Vietnamese, Serbian, and Slovene. 
Welcome, TC Bill Oil. You could take your mask off. Like uh, can I take it off now, go. Sandra? You yes. think we're okay? We're yeah. not going to get infected. Okay, good. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you for that list of books. I should say I just finished my 29th and 30th books. Just. And that puts me, you know, I'm, I'm a, I've been a good friend with Joyce Carol Oates since I was a very young writer. And now I'm only 2,622 books behind her. <laughs> and I'm going to try to catch up. Again, okay, you check out another 30 books and then see where you are then. But I would love <laughs> to say... What, what is most fascinating to me personally, because I met you at USC when you were a writing professor there and have been uh, after, long after I left in infamy because I couldn't finish, um, but you got your PhD in 19th century British literature. Is that not true? I cop to that, Sandra, and here's why. Um, when I went to the IR Writers Workshop, you were accepted on the basis of your work, and fortunately, they accepted me. But that very day that I got there, I realized that if I were going to write literature, it would be interesting to know something about it. And so I simultaneously began to take the PhD courses. Uh, I'm very glad that I did. Uh, at some point, I realized that I'm not going to be a scholar. I'm an artist. I'm going to make art. I want to live in my own mind all the time. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, it's very healthy sometimes to live in your own mind. But after three months of the lockdown, I told you yesterday, I'm so bored, I think my tonsils are starting to grow back. <laughs> I just want to ask one little <laughs> question, and this is a nerdy question. It's kind of like, so were your papers very fantabulistic in, in grad school? Were, did they just, you know, kind of like, were they inventive? Is that what we were saying? Or edging towards fiction? You, my dear, are a woman of many talents, as we all know. I have one thing going for me only, and fortunately, um, I was able to write those great papers because that was the gift I was given. Once I started to write fiction, though, I realized that that's what I want to do in life. It's great. I don't have anybody to tell me what to do. The world is confusing. There is no God. Life is completely and utterly meaningless, and every moment is a struggle with suicide. So why not? write and get out of your own brain and see what uh, what you can make of the world. One more question before I want to pivot to something that you're going to read for us. Was there a piece of 19th century British fiction that was a particular favorite of yours or you just got a kick out of it or anything from those many years that was a favorite book? Well, I read all the three volume novels as a matter of course. Uh, it was more uh, people like uh, the poets like Matthew Arnold, for instance, uh, who turned me on and especially uh, um, the poets of the gay 90s like, like Swinburne, for instance. You know, I was a hippie doing a lot of drugs and thinking, wow, these guys are pretty cool. Maybe I should learn about this. Uh, and that really is a good transition to many of the themes that you've written about, um, psychedelics, drugs, cannabis growing. So those of you who are of a, a younger generation who are maybe new to books, you must start reading T.C. Boyle from the beginning, start with Descent of Man from 1979 and go from there um, and, and build on that. So one thing I would say though, is even though you, you have so many characters and plots and approaches and stories all wildly imaginative and wildly entertaining, it seems you've always been comfortable in the past and the present and the future equally comfortable, which is really interesting. I know it's, it's hard for the critics to pin me down as a certain kind of writer, but I, I think that's what I want. Uh, I want to write any story in any mode in any time period. A story is a story, and I am just fascinated by finding out where it will go. I never know what it will be. I just have an idea, and I follow it. And the joy of it is to get into that mind space where you're out of your body for several hours a day. Now, you referenced my last book, Outside Looking In, which deals with the uh, early days of LSD uh, when Timothy Leary was a professor at Harvard and one of his students whom I've invented. Uh, <laughs> we seem to need to get out of our consciousness. Consciousness is a tremendous burden. Uh, playing music, as you do, for instance, uh, reading a book, uh, but especially the, in the moment of creation, when you're writing, 
uh, it is a trip to some place you can't imagine. And I need that. I need that every day of my life. So an interesting example of some of this journeying, in this case, forth into the future, is your book of short stories, After the Plague, which you published in 2001, and which is weirdly prescient, because you are imagining a plague that came down. And so that's almost 20 years ago. So I was wondering if you could read a few paragraphs from the opening of the title story. Yeah, sure, Sandra. It's, 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 unfortunately, it's extremely timely right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> let's see, see if I can get some light here. It, yeah, it's it's incredibly. It's almost spooky looking at it now. Twenty years ago, almost. Okay. After the plague. After the plague, it was some sort of Ebola mutation passed from hand to hand and nose to nose, like the common cold. Life was different, more relaxed and expansive, more natural. The rat race was over. The freeways were clear all the way to Sacramento and the poor dwindling ravaged planet was suddenly big and mysterious again. It was a kind of miracle really, what the environmentalists had been hoping for all along. Though of course, even the most strident of them wouldn't have wished for his own personal extinction, but there it was. I don't mean to sound callous. My parents are long dead and I'm unmarried and siblingless but I lost friends, colleagues, and neighbors, the same as any other survivor. What few of us there are, we're guessing it's maybe one in 10,000, here in the States anyway. Oh, I'm sure there are whole tribes that escaped it somewhere in the Amazon or the interior valleys of Indonesia, meteorologists in isolated weather stations, fire lookouts, goat herds, and the like. But the president's gone, the vice president, the cabinet, Congress, the joint chiefs of state, Staff, the chairman of the boards and CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies, along with all their stockholders, employees, and retainers. There's no TV, no electricity or running water. And there won't be any dining out anytime soon. <laughs> so, so, Except for the Wi-Fi animal crossing, that's the one thing. <laughs> completely so the fun, the fun of such scenarios, and of course, uh, had published A Friend of the Earth the year before this about global warming, um, is that we don't have the disease, we're fine. You know, this is the whole thing with horror stories as well. We can make fun of it, we can whistle in the dark. But it's, um, I'm just reading that now. Sure, I'm a wise guy and I'm snarking all the time, but that, um, that scenario is what we're living with now. And I'll tell you, it is pretty terrifying. I am in the high risk group, not only because of my age, by the way, I'm 93. I was 93 last December, but wow, because I'm a look, you look, you, that's you, my underlying condition. Stay over 91. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, my dear. I keep in shape, you know. So, and, and I think, well, we do have some fewer questions and I think I can all, it's, it's, and they, it's, it's interesting because from what you're describing, one viewer question uh, is, is they say, I, I love San Miguel, which is about two couples, like leaving the civilization, the continent to yes. become sheepers. Yes. Um, and so this person, talk about the research. I'm seeing if I can anticipate your answer already. Talk about the research that went into learning about the island. Did you personally spend a lot of time there? Well, we have to back up a moment. The, the year before I published uh, when the killing is done, which is set on Santa Cruz Island, the big one you see outside the window here from, from Santa Barbara. Uh, there's a fascinating story about the removal of the invasive species starting in the year 2000. I was fortunate to meet the biologists concerned with this and to go out on the island with the biologists and make their rounds and learn about the island. Meanwhile, that story was set contemporarily. Uh, in doing the research, I discovered the historical story of San Miguel and the two couples who lived there. And I did go out for a visit, but I did most of the research on Santa Cruz. You know, I don't want to say the islands are identical, but they're similar in terms of flora and fauna. Um, it was the hardest book I ever had to write. I'm always setting myself challenges, as we were saying earlier. There is no mode I won't attempt. There were two diaries I was working from, a fragmentary uh, memoir and a diary of women who had lived there in two different periods the 1880s and the 1920s and 30s. Um, 
I loved the tone of them and I loved the straightforward telling. I set myself the challenge not only to tell this from the point of view of women in another historical period, but without using irony or humor, my humor. I didn't, I, I wanted to iron that out and be these characters. So I'm very glad that I did it. I, about a hundred pages in, I was really just twirling that gun on my desk all day long because I didn't think I could do this. So I'm very pleased that uh, your uh, viewer um, liked the result. Yes, here's another one. Actually, this is named from Shelley Pogorelski. Um, I'm reading The Women. Is it a true story? And was Frank Lloyd Wright really the unethical scoundrel the narrator makes him out to be in parenthesis? These are your readers. I love the parenthesis in a very genteel manner as you're sitting in your Frank Lloyd Wright house done in the prairie style. But OK, that's the question. Well, th thanks so much. Uh, what, we moved out of LA and came to this house 27 years ago. And I thought I would like to learn more about the architect. And I thought I would write that book right away, but I wrote uh, many books before I finally got around to writing it. And I'm glad I did because it enabled me to go see a lot of his houses and to understand and appreciate his architecture and his genius. But you may know that I've written about uh, what I like to call the great egomaniacs of the 20th century before, like Dr. John Harvey Kellogg of the Road to Wellville, who invented the cornflake, or Alfred C. Kinsey of the Inner Circle, who, of course, invented sex. So uh, these figures, they have transformed our lives in ways that generals and so on and politicians don't. Uh, but each of them was just so utterly self-obsessed. Uh, Franklin Wright in particular. Uh, he, all of them, and Frank, had an interest in you only as you were an acolyte, and in some cases, with his apprentices, of course, a slave. So I'm always trying to figure out where that will go. And by the way, we mentioned earlier my latest uh, Outside Looking In, which is along these lines. It's about a student of Timothy Leary, who uh, insisted that his students take LSD. See, my, my mentor, when I got my PhD, Frederick P.W. McDowell, whom I loved, he wanted me to appreciate literature and read it. He didn't want me to take LSD, you know? <laughs> but imagine the pressure on a grad student to have to take LSD to be part of this club. So I'm always writing about such figures. Leary is one of them as well, who are gurus. And, I, I wonder, what is the cost to the individual to give yourself over body and soul to some regime of somebody else? It's a little scary. Particularly, remind me again, who is who's our, our president right now? Uh, I keep forgetting. The one after Obama, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, okay, two more questions about, well, let's see if we get to the one at a time. Okay, so this is another from one, uh, a reader. For T.C. Boyle, I saw The Road to Wellville film, then went back and read the book. Were you pleased with the film adaptation, the one by Ellen Parker? What did the film get right or wrong? I loved the film. Uh, it's so romantic and you rush, you rush with joy when you're the author and you see these actors, the beautiful actors reading your lines. I, have, I don't, had nothing to do with the film. I don't want to work in film because it, it is a distraction from what my life's job is to write my fiction and find where it's going. Um, I went to the premiere, of course. I, I love Alan. You know, the m movie he made before this was The Commitments. He's a brilliant, brilliant, yeah. brilliant yeah. filmmaker. Yeah. The, f the story is flat out hilarious and uh, follows the book uh, to the letter and it's great. I love it. Yeah, no, really fun. And Anthony Hopkins is just a scream in it. And it's, we just saw it recently again. It's, it's just very, okay. And this is a slightly longer question. Hopkins was, wait, wait. Yeah, Hopkins was great because he had already played Silence of the Lamb. So now he is <laughs> oh, being Kellogg. He's, <laughs> he's playing Kellogg and he's playing it for left, but he's got this menace, this weird menace. And I thought it was wonderful with the teeth and he's like running around oh my god yeah it was really and poor matthew broderick he yeah oh, it was really and john cusack hilarious you should watch it again it's it's really hilarious okay so this is a kind of a thoughtful what i mean it's a long question but i'm, I'm sure and this may be 
one of the last ones that we have. Um, but do you have any thoughts on the differences between reading a book, either the old fashioned way of turning physical pages and reading through a digital device? In addition, it's a long question, what are your thoughts regarding the newfound popularity of reading by listening to audiobooks versus visual reading? I hardly ever see anyone carrying a physical book anymore. If people are required to wait, they are always on their phones. Do you think any of these choices and changes in technology affect the way our brains work, absorb, learn, and enjoy through visual versus auditory processes? Have they affected the way that you write? You see the quality of the, the thoughtful quality of the viewers we have. So. Okay, wonderful. Lots of questions there. I'll answer the last one. No, it doesn't affect me in the slightest bit. I'm writing for the page and I'm writing to find out what, this, what the story will be and what it means. Um, I like the physical book. I like to page back. I like to smell it. I like to taste it. I like to lick it. You know, I like all of that. Uh, I use the Kindle when I'm traveling because I'm on a tour and I, you know, I, all I have room for is like, six pairs of underwear and eight pairs of socks and that's it. So I can't bring the, the entire book. So I do bring the Kindle and that's okay. It's all right. And you know what else, Sandra, as you know from book tours, you're stuck in some place in some fancy hotel and your gig is tomorrow and here you are, you've traveled all day, you're miserable. What do you want to do? You want peace. You want to eat in the restaurant by yourself and read. But you can't do that with a book. With a Kindle, it's lit on its own. You can prop it up by the candle on the table and, and read. Um, I don't mind it, but I love to page back. I miss the uh, idea of paging back to see things and, and, and reference things. I don't know uh, whether it requires different brainwaves. I love audiobooks. I've done many of them as the actor myself, but I only would only listen to them when I'm on an automobile trip someplace, especially a long trip. Uh, otherwise, I would rather have the book itself. Right. And you write on computer? I've always written uh, on a keyboard since uh, I began writing, which, of course, is before the computers were invented. <laughs> uh, I'm a nutball perfectionist, though, so it was great when computers came along to just continue on the keyboard, but now I don't have to X anything out. Yes. And, you know, the great thing, too, remember the fear in the beginning was you would write some great thought of genius and then you'd erase it and it's gone forever well so what you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter you just come up with another one <laughs> all right so in summation two things one can you tell us again the book that you just remind us of the book that you just last finished that is coming up the next well, one that's coming up okay so outside looking in is the one that was out this time okay. last year right. and it was an extensive book tour tour and thank god it was last year instead of this year yeah. um some authors are very unlucky to have a book out right now because they can't go on tour can they anyway the, the new one will be out next year and it is called talk to me and it is a return to my book talk talk in its themes that is uh how are we defined by language? How do we learn language? How important is language for our species? In this case, it's about the experiments to teach chimps to speak our language in the 70s and 80s. And then the book that I've just concluded to follow it is another book of stories, of 13 stories, and it would be called after the New Yorker piece, uh, I Walk Between the Raindrops. Oh, um, thank you so much, the great TC, Tom Corrigan Boyle. So thrilled to have you as our first featured author. Um, and thank you, and we hope we'll see you again sometime. Well, thank you so much, the great Sandra Singh Lowe. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, and thanks. And that's our show. Back to you, Sam. Well, thank you so much, um, everybody. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, let me see. Next week, please come back. We're going to be talking about new releases with authors Hector Tobar and Maggie Downs. And I'm sure we'll have some other surprises up our sleeve, will not we, Sandra? Charlene Woodard. Oh, a yes. Special guest with great theatrical and film challenge will be, yes, will be with us. Yes. So I hope you can come back from for more fun then. And as always, I encourage you to read our newspapers and visit our websites to stay informed with local news. And perhaps equally importantly, to find ways such as tonight's event to be entertained. Um, there'll be follow-ups on our website uh, on this event next week, so stay tuned for that. Thank you, and stay safe, everybody.